and welcome back to Brand Chain Chats, our new series where we take a few minutes to get to know the rock stars of our industry and dive into some of the hottest topics that get us all up and running each day. I'm Brian Gill, Chief Experience Officer here at Thumbprint, and I'm joined today by our special guest, Ben Grossman of Grossman Marketing Group. Ben, thanks for uh, thanks for making time, bud. Brian, thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah, man. Um, all right, so let's get started. Uh, why don't you give us a little background on yourself, on on the organization, and kind of how you fell into this incredible uh, industry of ours? Excellent. So, Ben Grossman, I'm co-president of Grossman Marketing Group with my older brother David. Grossman Marketing Group. It's a fourth generation family business. Uh, we were founded by my great grandfather Max Grossman in 1910 as a company called Massachusetts Envelope Company. We've evolved quite a bit over time. Uh, wait, wait, headquarters... 1910. That's you are you're over 100 years old. Is what you're talking? Yeah, 100, 100 years. All right, 113 years this? and incredible four generations. And uh, we're headquartered here in the Boston area. We have cool. a number of other offices around the country uh, as well as global distribution. Man, that's awesome, dude! Congratulations, as a, a fellow uh, family business uh, owner myself, it's uh, it's really cool, man. Um, so in your time there, uh, one of the things we want to talk about today is M and A's. And obviously, at your time at Grossman Marketing, you've helped with at least, I believe, eight acquisitions in the last right. let's just call it fifteen years. Um, you know, when it comes to acquisitions, what is it that what is it that you believe all parties are looking for to make a smooth transition? I believe this is a really hot topic right now in our industry. As distributors, we're seeing it happen at all on both sides of the fence, suppliers and distributors, it seems like weekly, monthly. Um, so tell us a little bit about what are you doing to ensure that cultures align, the organizations align? Like how what what how do you get to a successful acquisition? What we found over time is that empathy for the seller of the business is mission critical. That you know, what we've learned from sort of from going back to the first deal and over time is the importance of looking the seller in the eye and trying to understand what's driving them because what drives one seller is different from another seller. You know, someone may want to de-risk and take some money off the table and stay in the business. Some people might want to sell the business and move on right away. Some people might want to find a way to protect their legacy and their people. Uh, in a time of distress, there's all types of situations. So really trying to understand what is driving the seller and their unique situation, and then trying to figure out a way to structure a deal that addresses their concerns and priorities while also making financial sense uh, for us and, and our organization. So you mentioned the people part and how difficult is it going through this process as an owner I mean, I think that's one thing everyone's always saying, but how do I keep my best people? How do I make a decision that's in my best interest at this stage of my career, but also take care of the people that help me, you know, who've gotten me this far? Like how, how do you navigate those waters, you know? Going back to the first deal that my brother and I closed on after our father moved on to pursue full-time public service, this was a transaction that we did in 2013. And we sat with the owner and she sat across the table from us at lunch and she said, look, there are two things that matter to me in this conversation. One is protecting my legacy and two is protecting my people. She then invited us in to meet with her people. She was pretty transparent with her team. Um, she was looking to retire and not too, not too long, long time from then. And she wanted to make sure that her very valued colleagues would feel comfortable with us, uh, we, um, but also would be likely to remain with us because that deal was structured, like a lot of deals in our industry, where there's some money up front, but then yeah. there's quite a bit of money based on retained gross profit over generally three, three years. And so with that situation, not only did she want to find a way to make her colleagues and her employees feel comfortable and valued, but she also wanted to make sure that they stayed with us to deliver on um, the financial upside that she was hoping for in that in that deal situation, and so in those in those opportunities where we get a chance to sit with the employees, the valued employees of a prospective acquisition, we just we, we try to be transparent. We try to explain to them what our values are, what drives us, where we're trying to go with our company, and why we think that target organization would would be a fit in our company. 
And hopefully that jives. We, we, you know, we tell the truth as my dad likes to say, and he learned from someone else, you always tell the truth and then you don't ever have to remember what you said. And that's really important in those situations, not to overpromise, not to promise them the moon and, and tell them that you're going to do things that you can't deliver on because that's a surefire way to lose credibility once you get into the integration stage of a deal. Yeah. And you're dealing with the most intimate of transactions, right? So if something doesn't go well, people in this industry talk. And if you do it well, then you know, you're going to open up the doors to a, non- a number of other opportunities. Well, and along the same lines of it's a small industry and people, people do talk, we have acquired other companies that have been referred to us either by former owners who sold their business to us or former owners who sold their business to us remained with us in the fold and got to talk into someone else they knew in the space. That person said, hey, tell me about gross and marketing. What's been your experience? And I mean, that could be no better reference than a reference from someone who you did a deal with. And we try, um, we find, again, there's some natural skepticism on the part of uh, prospective sellers of who are you? What's your background? Are you really who you say you are? And we're very transparent about it. Generally, in those conversations, we say, hey, these are all the acquisitions we've ever done. Mm -hmm. Um, You choose who you'd like to call and we'll give you their contact information. Some of them uh, may not be the right fit because they might have been too small or they might have been a different, you know, uh, age and stage of their career. But any one of them, we we subscribe to sort of radical transparency when it comes to those reference calls. But the fact that that you lead with that, so I don't have to come ask you, right? Just put that out there. Like when you lead with that, then that's very disarming. Like, wow, you're already telling me here they are. If you want to connect with them, I'm not coming and asking you, hey, would you mind sharing the contact of someone you closed the deal with in the past, right? Like put it out there before they can even ask. And I think that that establishes a really great baseline of transparency and honesty moving forward, right? It kind of changes the conversation. No, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Because think about it. If you, if we were in their shoes and considering selling, the first conversation I'd want to have would be with someone that they did a transaction with a few years prior to understand what kind of promises did they make? Do they keep their promises? How do they treat me? How do they treat my people? And yeah. then along those lines from a transparency perspective, when we, when we get into the financials of those deals and, yeah. and measuring sort of those earnouts or shared upside, they yeah. get the same data we get. We give them a direct export from our ERP system. So they yeah. see all the costs of every transaction, all the sell, um, so that it's not, awesome. we're not just reporting top line, but we give them all the data for, for them to look at if they'd so choose. That's great, man. Um, there's so many things I want to cover. And I know that the, uh, the Oscar, uh, symphony is going to play for me in a couple of minutes. Ago. And, uh, so, uh, what I do want to know is real quick, you have a background in print. I have a background in print. I love it. Um, it's not dead contrary to popular belief. So real quick, how did you get from print to where you are today? Quite the journey. I know it didn't happen overnight. Turns out it happened over a hundred years of 365 nights, but how'd you get there? And, um, what are you really excited about in the business right now? Great, uh, wonderful questions. So a gentleman named Fred Feldman, uh, who had owned his own distributorship and had sold it back in the late 90s, got introduced to our father, um, who at the time was still running our family business. And he said to our dad, Steve, he said, promotional products would be a natural extension of what you all do. You're a creative organization. Um, you come up with creative solutions for your clients. You're not just putting ink on paper, but you're yeah. trying to build a total solution package. And I think that promotional products would be a natural fit. And so our dad and, um, and, and my brother, who were at the business at the time, hired Fred to help architect the growth of a promotional products business unit. So we didn't just sign up for a distributor number and, and start selling basic items we had you're very intentional you're very intentional and you invested in this next stage you didn't just yeah let me sign up and walk an asi show and next you know i'm an a i'm a promotional products expert exactly uh because just like in the in the print and marketing space you need to be an expert in what you do similarly promotional products 
you need to be an expert at merchandising and understanding who the audience is and the demographic is and coming up with the right solution. And so Fred helped bring that, uh, bring that not those decades of knowledge and helped all of our salespeople in all of our territories cross sell and extend what they sold to their client base. And based awesome. on that, that foundational knowledge that Fred brought came the growth that we've seen today. And so it was intentional, um, but all of the acquisitions primarily that we've done over the last decade plus have been in the promotional product space. My Do brother, I, yeah, the reason we went down this path, um, you know, our dad moved on from the business. He was elected to public office in Massachusetts in 2010 and moved on from the business in 2011. It's a, it's a great succession plan if you can, if you can have it. Yeah, uh, and so my brother enough. and I were looking at each other and thinking about, how can we grow? Obviously need more clients and, you know, can grow organically, but thinking about why did we want to grow through M&A? Why did we want to go down that path? We had a, um, it's sort of almost a classic business school case study. We had some older business lines that were slower growth, and we wanted to try to take the cash flows from the sm those slower growth business lines or potentially no growth business lines and invest in what we thought could be faster growth business units, which yeah. we determined promotional products and branded merchandise to be, and especially e-commerce services. 100%. And so all of those transactions have been focused on building out that part of our business. So we went, you know, a decade plus ago, we went from branded merchandise being 10, 15% of our business to now the overwhelming majority of our business. And um, it's been, it's, it's been a, a good, good transition for us. I don't need to tell you it's working. So congrats. Um, Thank you. There's more I want to cover uh, guys. There's one thing that Ben is involved in that I recommend all of you check out. We don't have time to cover today, but go to swagcycle.net. If you haven't heard of swag cycle, you need to learn about it. Your clients will thank you for it. Um, I'm going to give Ben a minute to let you know how to connect with him. If you have questions, please reach out, request their white paper and get started. Ben, Dude, thank you for the time, man. I know you're busy. Really appreciate it. Please tell the audience how to get a hold of you. And uh, I'm sure you're going to have some requests coming your way pretty soon. Excellent. Uh, Brian, thank you again. Really appreciate it. Uh, best way to reach me is ben at grossmanmarketing.com or you can find me on LinkedIn. I'd love to talk about M&A in our space and see if we can potentially uh, give some advice and guidance to our peers in the industry. And then like you said, Swag Cycle, it's focused on keeping obsolete branded merchandise out of landfills through charitable donations, as well as upcycling and recycling efforts. And yeah. we'd love to share that as well. It's great, man. Everyone go do your homework. It's a very important topic. Ben, thank you for being here. Uh, to the audience, thank you guys. We'll uh, see you next month. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. Thanks, Brian.